All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to find the derivative of inverse functions given the original function. And so before we can talk about that, we first need to do a little bit of review and recall what an inverse function even is. And so you probably first encountered inverse functions in either algebra or a pre-calculus course, but just to kind of remind you of what it is, an inverse function, which we denote with f with a negative one as a superscript, right? This is not an exponent, it is a superscript. And then we have x in parentheses, right? This represents the inverse function of a function f of x, right? And so this is the inverse function of f of x if these two statements are true. First we have if you plug the inverse function into the original function, you will output just x. And if you have the original function plugged into the inverse function, that is also equal to x. And so think of the inverse function as just a way to undo a regular function. And so for example, let's say we had the function f of x is equal to x plus five. What would be the inverse function of this function? Well, there's a three-step process that we can do to find that inverse function. And so step one is to just set y equal to this function. So we're just gonna rewrite the function so we have y is equal to x plus five. And then step two is going to be to swap our variables. We are going to change y to be x and we're gonna change x to be y. And so we'll have x is equal to y plus five. And then our third step is to solve for y in this new equation we have here. And so if we do that by subtracting five to the other side, we'll have x minus five. And so we'll have that y is equal to x minus five. And so this right here is going to be the inverse function of f of x or x plus five. And so I'll just write that f inverse of x is equal to x minus five. And so now let me clean up this work a little bit here. If we wanna to check to make sure that this is the inverse function of f of x, then we can try plugging them into each other like we have in these statements right here and see if it outputs x. And if it does, then this is the inverse function of f of x. And so let's start by plugging the inverse function into the original function. So we're gonna be testing out this statement right here first. And so we'll have f of f inverse of x is equal to x plus five, but x is gonna be replaced with x minus five. So I'll start by writing our original function, x plus five, but we're gonna replace x with our inverse function, right? We're plugging this in to our original function. So we are gonna have x minus five. And so now, if we go through and simplify this, we're gonna have x minus five plus five, and so this negative five and this positive five will cancel out, and this will just be equal to x. And so that checks out, but let's test the second statement. Let's try plugging the original function into the inverse function, and let's see if that's still equal to x. And so now we're gonna have f inverse of f of x, and that will be equal to x minus five. But again, we're gonna be replacing x with our original function, x plus five. So we're gonna have x plus five. And if we simplify this, we're gonna have x plus five minus five, and so this positive five and this negative five will cancel out. And so this will be equal to just x. And so this also checks out. And so we know that x minus five is the inverse function of x plus five. All right, and so then just a few more things to note about inverse functions really quick. If you were to graph a function and its inverse, they would be symmetric about the line y equals x, right? So if we had our coordinate plane with our x axis, and our y-axis, a function in its inverse would be symmetric about this line, which is y equals x. And so what ends up happening as a result of this is that ordered pairs for a function and its inverse are going to be reversed or swapped. So for example, if we were to look at this function right here, f of x equals x plus five, and we wanted to know the point when we plug in x equals one, if we plug one into this function, we'll have one plus five, and that's equal to six. And so we know that for the original function here, we have a point of one comma six, but what would this be for the inverse function? Well, it's going to be the reverse. We're going to swap the x and y values. And so for that inverse function, we would have six comma one. 
And so this is going to be important to remember when we look at an example later on in this video. All right, and so with that, that is everything that I wanted to review about inverse functions. And so now we're ready to talk about how to find the derivative of them. And so if we want to find the derivative of an inverse function, we have three different methods that we can use. And so the first way is to use this formula that most calculus textbooks will provide you with. You'll be told that the derivative of f inverse of x is equal to 1 divided by the derivative of the original function, f prime, of the inverse function, right? We're plugging that inverse function into the derivative of the original function, and that is all underneath 1. Our second method is going to involve using implicit differentiation. And our third method is to just simply find the inverse function and differentiate it as normal. And so we're gonna be looking at all three of these methods. And so let's start by looking at this formula. All right, so here's our formula once again. And so just to make this a little bit easier to comprehend, I wanna show you something first before we look at an example. And so consider the function y equals f of x. Right. Typically, we interchange these when we're working with functions. We will switch it to f of x or we'll switch it to y. Right. Y is equal to f of x. If we want to find the inverse of this function, we would switch the variables of x and y. And so we'll have that x is equal to f of y. And then we would want to solve for y. And so in this case, in order to find that, if we took the inverse of both sides, right, if we have f inverse of f of y, the inverse function undoes the original function. And so we would have that f inverse of x is equal to y. And so what we can do here is rewrite this formula. Instead of having it written in this notation, we could replace f inverse of x with y. And this y would represent the inverse function of whatever function we have. And so this is going to be helpful when we go through the process of finding the derivative of an inverse function. And so maybe you'll find this version of the formula to be a little bit easier to comprehend. Instead of having f prime of the inverse function, we just have f prime of y, where y is that inverse function. And so now let's take a look at an example problem here. Let's say we have the function f of x is equal to x cubed plus one. And we wanna find the derivative of this function's inverse. How are we going to find that using this formula? Well, the first thing I'm going to do here is find the derivative of this function because we're going to need it to even use this formula, right? We need a derivative f prime of x because we're going to plug that inverse function into it. So we need a derivative of that original function. And so I'll have f prime of x is equal to 3x squared if we use the power rule on x cubed. And so you'd multiply three down, so you'd have three x, and then you subtract one from your exponent, so you have three minus one, which equals two. And then of course the derivative of one is zero because the derivative of any constant is zero. And so if this is f prime of x, what would f prime of y be? Well, if we just plug y into this function, we will have that f prime of y is equal to three y squared. And so for this function, we can say that this is equal to one divided by three y squared. And so now we're not done yet because obviously this is not in terms of x, this is in terms of y. We wanna find the derivative in terms of x. And so what are we gonna plug in for y here? Well, you might be tempted to rewrite this function as y equals x cubed plus one and then plug it into this expression, but do not do that because remember that this y represents the inverse function, not the original function. And so all we have to do is find the inverse function of this function right here, y equals x cubed plus one. And so we'll start by swapping the variables of x and y, and we'll have that x is equal to y cubed plus one, and now we wanna solve for y. And that's going to give us our inverse function. And so we'll start by subtracting one from both sides, and so we'll have x minus one is equal to y cubed, and if we take the cubed root of both sides, that will eliminate this y cubed, and we'll just be left with y, and so we'll have y is equal to the cubed root of x minus one. And so now because it's gonna be more convenient to work with, I'm gonna rewrite this cubed root to just be x minus one to the one third power. I think that's gonna make it a little bit easier to work with, and you'll see why in a second. But first, let me just rewrite this. We will have x minus one to the one third power. And now we have y, our inverse function. And so let's plug our inverse function into this y in this equation, which represents the derivative of our inverse function. And so this will be equal to one divided by three times x minus one to the power of one third squared. 
right? We plugged in this function for y, and so we have that quantity to the one-third power squared. And so when you have an exponent inside another quantity that is raised to an exponent, we multiply the exponents, and so you'll have one-third times two, and so this will be equal to one divided by three times x minus one to the two-thirds power, because one-third times two is two-thirds. And so now what we have here is the derivative of the inverse of this function right here. That is how this formula works. And so that's the first method of finding the derivative of an inverse function. But let's look at the other two methods, which are gonna get you this exact same answer, but in a slightly different way. All right, so our second method is to use implicit differentiation. And so we have the same example here. This is the same function we worked with last time, f of x equals x cubed plus one. And in order to use implicit differentiation to find the derivative of the inverse of this function, we're first going to want to rewrite this function to have y instead of f of x. And so we'll have y is equal to x cubed plus one. And then what we're going to do is swap these variables as if we were getting ready to find our inverse function, right? So let's do that real quick. We're gonna swap x and y. And so we'll have x is equal to y cubed plus one. But then what we're going to do, instead of solving for the inverse function here, is take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to x, which is going to require implicit differentiation because we're gonna be taking the derivative of y with respect to x. And so watch what happens if we do this. If we take the derivative with respect to x of this whole equation, we will have the derivative of x, which is just going to be one, and this is going to be equal to the derivative of y cubed with respect to x. And so we start by treating y cubed as if it was a function defined with x. The derivative would be three y squared if we use the power rule. We multiply three down and subtract one from the exponent, so we have three y squared. But remember, because of implicit differentiation, or the fact that we are differentiating y with respect to x, we also need to multiply by dy dx. And then we're done taking a derivative of y cubed, and then finally the derivative of one is just zero because the derivative of any constant is zero. And so now what we wanna do here is solve for dy dx, right? That is going to be the derivative of our inverse function. If we had instead solved for y for this equation right here after we swapped our variables, we would have gotten our inverse function. And so since we took the derivative of this inverse function, that's why dy dx is the derivative of the inverse function. And so then if we solve for this, we'll have to divide both sides by three y squared. And so we will have that dy dx is equal to one divided by three y squared, right? That's what we would get if we divide both sides by three y squared. And so now look at what we have right here. This is identical to what we had in our previous method with the formula after we found the derivative of f of x and plugged in y. And so now all that's left to do here is to plug in y or the inverse function of our original function, right? So if we swap the variables again in this function, we will have x is equal to y cubed plus one, and we solve for y, we will get our inverse function again. And so we'll have that x minus one is equal to y cubed if we subtract one from both sides. And then if we take the cubed root again of both sides, or we just take it to the one third power, we will find that y is equal to x minus one to the one third power, right? We had already found this earlier, but we found it again so that we can plug this in to this derivative once again. And so we'll have that this is equal to one divided by three times the quantity x minus one to the one third power squared. And so this will simplify to one divided by three times x minus one to the two thirds power because two times one third is two thirds. And so now we have found the derivative once again of the inverse function of x cubed plus one. And so that is how we use implicit differentiation to find that derivative. But we have one more method that we can use, which is probably the most straightforward method that you can use to find the derivative of an inverse function. All right, so here's our third and final method for finding the derivative of an inverse function. And this one, like I said, is pretty straightforward. All we're going to do is find the inverse of this function and then take its derivative which seems like why wouldn't we do that to start with, but a lot of textbooks are interested in having you use that formula that we used in our first method because it can be very helpful depending on what kind of function you are working with. But anyway, let's try and find the derivative of the inverse of this function. And so let's start by finding the inverse of this function. 
And so first we'll start by writing that y is equal to x cubed plus one. And now let's swap our variables. So we're gonna have x is equal to y cubed plus one. And we're gonna solve for y. So we're gonna have x minus one is equal to y cubed. And then if we take the cubed root of both sides or take each side to the one third power, we will have that y is equal to x minus one to the power of one third. All right, and so now if we wanna find the derivative of this inverse function, let's just take the derivative of it, right? So I'll do that up here. We will have that y prime is equal to the derivative of this function. And so this is going to require the use of the chain rule because we have a composite function where x minus one is the inside function and this quantity to the one third power is the outside function. And so we'll start by taking the derivative of the outside function and we'll have one third times x minus one, right? That inside function does not change. And then we will subtract one from the exponent, right? We multiplied the exponent down and now we're subtracting one from it. And then we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which in this case is just one because the derivative of x is just one and the derivative of negative one is zero. And so we'll multiply by one. And if we simplify, this is equal to one third times x minus one to the power of negative two thirds, right? One third minus one is negative two thirds. And so if we move this quantity with a negative power to the denominator, that would make the power positive, which we like to have. And so this will be equal to one divided by three times x minus one to the two thirds power, which is the derivative of the inverse function of our original function. And you'll notice that this is the exact same answer that we got from the other two methods as well. So whether you use the formula that I gave you, whether you use implicit differentiation, or we just find the inverse and take the derivative of that function, you will get the same answer each way. All right, and so before we end this lesson, there's one more example that I wanna take a look at. All right, so for this last example, we wanna find the derivative of the inverse function of f of x equals x cubed plus one at x equals two. And so this is the same function that we have been working with this entire video. And so we already know what that derivative is. The part of this question that I wanna focus on is what does it mean by finding it at x equals two? Is it going to be as simple as just plugging two into that function? And we'll talk about that, but first let's just write down what our derivative is. We know that the derivative d dx of the inverse function is equal to one divided by three times x minus one to the two thirds power, right? That is what we found three times in this video. But we wanna evaluate this at x equals two. Now keep in mind, this x equals two is for the original function. And so the first thing that we should do here is find the full coordinate point for this value of x. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a second. But first, let's find that coordinate point. So let's plug two into this function. We know that f of two will be equal to two cubed plus one, and that will be equal to eight plus one because two cubed is eight, and that will be equal to nine. And so what that tells us is the full coordinate point is two comma nine, right? That is the coordinate point for x equals two on this function. When x is two, y is equal to nine. And so remember what we said at the beginning of this video when we were reviewing what an inverse function is? We said that the inverse function and the original function were symmetric about the y equals x line, and that meant that all the coordinate points were swapped. And so this is defined for f of x, right? This is the coordinate point for f of x, which means that for the inverse function, we're going to have the opposite coordinate point of nine comma two, right? We swap the x and y values. And so do not plug x equals two into the derivative of your inverse function. Instead, swap the values of your coordinate point to get the equivalent coordinate point for the inverse function and then plug in that value of x, which in this case is nine. And so this will be equal to one divided by three times nine minus one to the two thirds power, which is equal to one divided by three times the cubed root of eight squared, right? The two thirds power is the same as squaring the cubed root of that value. And so the cubed root of eight is two. And so this will be equal to one divided by three times two squared, which is equal to one divided by three times four, which is equal to one divided by 12. And so that is the derivative of our inverse function at x equals two. All right, and so with that, that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.